We finished last week with a few quick examples on transposition techniques. So, so, so these classical ciphers are being used to demonstrate concepts that are used in real ciphers. So with the substitution techniques, we went through from a very basic Caesar building up to the one-time pad. The one-time pad is the best. It's perfect for security. You can't break it. The only problem with the one-time pad is that the key that we need and it must be as long as the plain text. I want to encrypt a large file. My key must be the same length of that file. And there's two problems with that. Distributing large keys is hard. How do I get the key to you? We said we need some mechanisms for distributing keys in a, a secure manner. That's hard. And in fact, it turns out generating long sequences of bits which are random is not easy. So we sometimes take for granted how random numbers are generated. Call the rand function in your, your programming language. But what's the algorithm for creating random numbers? It's sometimes quite challenging to create a truly random sequence of, of bits. So one time pad is what we call unconditionally secure. Under no conditions can you break it. But it's not practical to use. So we need to make a trade-off of maybe less secure, but more practical to use. They were substitution techniques. Transposition is rearranging. And we went through quick examples of rail fence and rows columns. Rail fence, write our plain text and read it, write it in rows, read it in write it across three rows in this case and then read row by row to get the ciphertext. So just a way to rearrange the, the plain text. And a second one, rows, columns. We, what do we do? We wrote our plain text across a set of columns and then we read the columns, but the order in which we read the columns is determined by the key. The key is that sequence of six digits there, the, the column ordering. Read, read the second column first, because the one is there. Read this column first, this column second, and third. So E, Y, Y, A, and so on. We get ciphertext. That one is a good one to practice. That is uh, decrypting. I, I, will not, I, not sh I don't show the algorithm for decrypting. You should try to decrypt all of these ciphers. Some are obvious. Some are easy to go backwards. Basically, decryption should be the inverse operation. And the easy way to test if you understand decryption is if you get the original plain text back. So I suggest uh, maybe try decrypting and see if you can work out the algorithm for decrypting in that case. Transposition is not very useful in terms of frequency analysis because the same characters of the plain text exist in the ciphertext. We do not hide any of those statistics of the frequency of letters. If there are 12% E's in the plain text, with transposition techniques on their own, there'll be 12% of E's in the cipher text. We don't substitute, we just rearrange. So that's uh, the weakness of these, but they play an important role in, in real ciphers, transposition. So let's summarize with a couple of concepts. Uh, this illustrates a, a concept we use in real ciphers and using the ro rows columns transposition. What I've done is uh, there's, there's original plain text, attack postponed until 2 a.m. and we padded it out with X, Y, Z. Okay, so that was our plain text. And we had a key, 4312567. And we applied the rows column transposition. That is, we wrote the plain text across a set of seven columns, row by row. Why seven? Because our key contains the numbers one to seven. And then read column by column. And if you encrypt that, you get this ciphertext. You can check later. T, T, N, A, da, 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 and so on. Now, Look at the numbers here. The other way to think of that, transposition is rearranging letters. So 
So we can think the first letter in the plain text moves to another position in the ciphertext. And that's what these numbers do. We say that the first letter of the plain text, 0, 1, which was an A, after applying our transposition cipher, it moved to where? After the first transposition, it moved to where's 0, 1? Why can't I see it? Here it is. Position, what is it? Uh, 13. So that cipher takes the letter A in the plaintext, the very first letter, and if you map where it ends up, it ends up here as position 13 in the ciphertext. That's what these numbers show. Uh, the third letter in the plaintext, T, the second T there, ends up as the first letter in the ciphertext. So that's shown here that letter number three ends up at position one after we encrypt. So this is the original ordering of the letters, zero, uh, one through to 28, just wrapped it across two rows. After we encrypt, we end up with this ordering of those letters. So number three is in the first position, number 10 is in the second position, and so on. Look at this set of numbers. Can you see a pattern? Look closer. So no is the wrong answer. Find the pattern. Plus seven. Okay, you can you see, okay, that with respect to the numbers, which is just the referring to the letter positions in the plain text, three, 10, 17, 24. 3 plus 7 is 10, 10 plus 7 is 17, 17 plus 7 is 24. Okay, there's some, maybe some pattern, and you see, okay, in the next four, 4, 11, 18, 25, another pattern of plus 7. Okay, 4 plus 7 is 11, and so on. So we see that there is some pattern in the ciphertext. That's bad. When we encrypt something, the ciphertext should appear random. Random means there is no pattern. Okay, so when we can easily see a pattern, then that suggests that it's not so good at encrypting. The encryption should hide the patterns. It should make it appear random. So the point here is that applying this simple cipher produces ciphertext which has some quite easy to recognize pattern. Okay. If we write the letters as, as numbers, as in this case, it's not hard to see that it's plus seven. Why seven? The key goes up to seven, meaning in our cipher there's seven columns. So there's some relationship there. Uh, so you could go and work out the algorithm and see why uh, it's seven and there's four of those entries. So it's not so good there, because there is a pattern in the ciphertext. But we take that ciphertext, TTNA, so on, we encrypt it again using the exact same cipher and same key. And we get this output, NSC and so on. And the correspondence of the original plain text letters and the rearrangement is in the last set of numbers towards the bottom of the slide, which means that the very first letter of our plain text, 0, 1, after one application of our encryption ends up at position 13, but after two ends up here at position number 22. Okay, so it's just rearranging again. What's the pattern in the second output? Anyone see it? Look at that second sequence of numbers and see if you can see some, some relationship between subsequent numbers or some form of pattern. I cannot see it. Uh, if you see it, tell me. Okay? It's th applying the encryption operation the second time has started to hide the pattern of the plaintext. So it, to me it appears more random than the first output ciphertext. 
And this is a concept commonly used in ciphers today, is that repeating simple operations, simple encryption steps, so this transposition cipher is quite simple, just rearranged uh, by rows and columns. In the first instance, it didn't provide much security because we see that there's some pattern in the output. But applying the same simple cipher again improves the security. It mixes things up more, making it harder to recognize any pattern in the output. And that's a concept that we use. R applying simple operations multiple times can improve the security of an encryption algorithm. Not just applying transpositions, but the same can be said for substitutions. And in fact, the general approach is to combine them. Do a substitution cipher, maybe like Caesar cipher or Visionaire. Take the output of that, do a transposition, like this rows columns, and then take the output of that and do another Visionaire cipher. That is, apply substitutions substitutions and transpositions one after each other and then repeat again. This concept of repeating the encryption starts to produce more random looking ciphertext each time. So real ciphers today are built upon those principles of combining transpos transpositions and substitutions plus repeating that multiple times basically looping through, encrypt, encrypt the ciphertext, encrypt that output and keep going multiple times. And that leads us to the, the real ciphers, the block ciphers that we'll look at. And we'll go through one example of a real cipher and see that those principles in, in place. Any questions so far on classical ciphers? We've got substitutions and transpositions as the basic operations. And the same applies in real ciphers. And what we do is we combine them. Do a substitution operation, do a transposition operation. And then, in fact, do it all again. And do it again, and that builds up the real ciphers that you have today. What's the problem of doing it again and again and again? Okay, we've done two transpositions. What if we do a hundred? More secure, what's the problem? It takes time. Okay, with security we care about the trade-off between security, how secure it is, and maybe usability, how easy it is to use. And one, one common measure of usability is how well it performs. If I encrypt a file and it takes me one day to encrypt it, then that's not so good for the user, not so convenient. So we need algorithms that are secure but also fast. So there's a trade-off there. What else before we move on to the next lectures? Uh, just return to, we've gone through I think seven classical ciphers. Which one's best? Common quiz question. Tell me the best of all the seven. <laughs> One time pad. Okay. And another concept to always think about is well, the idea with cipher is just to produce random output. Okay. If it's random, then there's no structure of the plain text represented in the cipher text. Plain text always has structure. We don't have random messages we want to send to people. Who, who sends random emails to their friends? No one. Because a random message contains no useful information. So when we're communicating, we have structured messages. But what we want is that, so that the attacker cannot determine what that message is, we want the ciphertext to have no structure, to appear random. So having a random ciphertext is what we aim for. And the one-time pad does that. The one-time pad takes our structured plain text and really shifts each letter by a random number of positions based upon the key. Remember the one-time pad was the Visionaire cipher, but the key is as long as the plain text and random. What was the Visionaire cipher? The Caesar cipher, but with different keys. 
All right, so it's all built on the Caesar cipher. We take the letter I in plain text, we shift it by S positions, where we can think that we can map these letters to numbers, and we get the letter A. We take the letter N, we shift by I positions, we get the letter V. Well, one time pad is exactly the same, but instead of using a keyword, we use a random sequence of characters here. Take the letter I, shift by a random number of positions, we'll get a random output. Take the letter N, shift by a random number of positions, and we'll get a random output. Can we write an equation for the one time pad? Try. Write an equation for the one time pad. Common written quiz question, maybe even an exam question. An equation like the way we wrote an equation for the Caesar cipher. Go back to the Caesar cipher. Our very first one. Write an equation which is for the one time pad. And the hint is, well, the one time pad uses the Caesar cipher, but it changes the key each plain text letter we encrypt. And again, we're assuming that letters map to numbers. That's how we write the equation in this case, that P, uh, the plain text, corresponds to the uh, plain text letter. We map that to a number. A becomes 0, B becomes 1, and so on. That's how we can interpret it as an equation. It's actually, we can do it in different ways, but uh, maybe the simplest way to think of it I'll generalize it. I'll say ciphertext position I equals the plain text in position I plus the key K of position I all mod 26. That's effectively the one time pad, which what I mean is that the plain text P the string is made up of P1, P2, P3. It's made up of letters. P, I, say the length N. An N character plain text. We can think of just N letters and we denote P1, P2, P3. And similar, the key in the one time pad, we have K. 1, K2, K3, Ki, and the key is the same length as the plain text, Kn, and to get the cipher text, all we do is we take P1, the letter, but represent it as a number, and similar the first letter of the key, and but represent it as a number, add them together, Mod by 26, and we get our ciphertext, C1. So in fact, the one-time pad, this perfect cipher, is really an extension of the Caesar cipher, the very first known cipher. It's just that K is no longer fixed. In the original Caesar cipher, for every letter of plain text, K was always the same value. In the one time pad, K is changing and it's random. That is, K1 is a random letter, K2 is a random letter, and so on.
Of course, we don't nowadays deal with just English characters. We usually, when we have encryption on computers, we use binary as an input. Okay, so the input is a sequence of bits. So if it's an English letter that we want to encrypt, A, we look at the binary representation, maybe use ASCII to encode that as 8 bits. If it's some other language, then again, there are encodings to binary. If it's an image, there are encodings to binary. So our real ciphers today just operate on binary. Let's consider the one-time pad in the binary form. What would it be? What would the equation be if we're using binary? This was the form when we're using, let's say, just English, uh, let's say, lowercase, just one case. Uh, we were not using both upper and lowercase. We were just, just 26 letters. What if we use one time pad but with binary? What's the equation, the general equation? Someone tell me. How many letters, how many characters with binary? Two. So how have we changed the equation? Mod two. Mod two. <laughs> Easy. It's ex exactly the same. Instead of mod by 26, why do we mod by 26? To do that wrap around. Okay? To wrap it around when we shift. If we've got 0 and 1, it's then the input plain text is either a 0 or 1, so we need to mod by 2 to wrap around. So the equation becomes CI equals PI plus KI mod 2, where the plain text is, either z is a sequence of zeros and ones. Let's consider some possible values. What if PI, what are the values of P, potential values? PI, 0 or 1. Okay, good. What are the potential values of K? 0 or 1. So in fact, we've got four combinations. That is, if my plain text letter is 0, my key could be 0. My plain text letter was 1, my key could be 0, or my key could be 1, and the plain text could be one of the two values. So there are four possible combinations there. Let's look at the ciphertext we get when we encrypt. Plug those values into our equation. What do we get? PI is 0, 0 plus 0 is 0, 0 mod 2 is 0. 1 plus 0 is 1. 1 mod 2, 1. 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 mod 2, 1. 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 mod 2, 0. Easy. Do you recognize what operation that was? It's XOR. That is, that's the same as PI exclusive or with ki right exclusive or zero exclusive or zero is zero one and zero is one zero and one is one one and x or one is zero so in fact the one time pad when we're using binary is in fact the same as exclusive or the plain text and the key so the one time pad in binary is really just c or C I equals P X or K. Again, that's very nice because in hardware, implementing exclusive OR is very fast. Okay, it's very easy to do. So you have a plain text, a sequence of bits, a million bits. To provide perfect encryption, all you need to do is generate a one million bit random number, the key and exclusive all with your plain text, and you'll get cipher text that is unbreakable. So it's, it's a very, very simple cipher. The problem, the key's too long. 
but exclusive or becomes an important operation in, in encryption. One way to encrypt something, take your plain text XOR with a random sequence. K in this case. So in practice, we often think of the one-time pad as just X or the plain text with a random key. And we'll see that come up later. And what if the plain text is not a binary number? What if the plain text is not a binary number, for example? Like a string, uh, like a string of word, like some words, yeah. then convert it to binary. <laughs> okay, can't we convert everything to binary nowadays? You know, ASCII encoding converts text to binary, all the different encodings, UTF and so on, converts different languages into binary. What about images, pictures? Well, again, we can save pictures on our hard disk, that is just a binary representation of an image. So the algorithms of JPEG and so on specify how to convert colors to binary representations. Video we can convert to binary, voice we can convert to binary, Everything today we can convert to binary. So when we encrypt, we're dealing with binary input and binary ciphertext. So uh, one type pad is XOR. Let's move on to the next topic on block ciphers and see some of these concepts applied in real ciphers. Ah, but wait, did I skip some slides earlier? I think I did. We've done brute force attacks. All right. We've talked about them. I think we've said that this 26 factorial is actually the key space. A couple of slides here. This one, this one's important. How do we measure the security of an algorithm? How can we say one algorithm is more secure than another? Well, first we can talk about unconditionally secure. That is impossible to break. If we have ciphertext and there's no information in it such that we can find out the plain text or key, then we call that cipher that produces produce the ciphertext unconditionally secure. The only known algorithm that does that, the only one is the one-time pad. It is unconditionally secure, but as we've said several times, it's not very practical because we need a key. So, in fact, talking about unconditionally secure is not very useful in comparing ciphers because there's only one cipher in the world that is unconditionally secure. All the others are conditionally secure, secure under certain conditions. So, in fact, we need another way to measure. So, we talk about computationally secure. So we say a cipher is computationally secure if the cost of breaking that cipher it exceeds the value of the information we obtain from breaking it. The example of that is that uh, I encrypt the, um, the password for my bank account using some cipher and you get the cipher text. So what you want to do is you want to uh, decrypt that ciphertext and you'll find my password, then you can access my bank account and take all my money. Okay? So it's a cipher such that you try and break it and it takes you, you, what you do, you know it's a strong cipher, you go buy a new computer to try and break it, okay, to do some operations. You spend uh, 100,000 baht on some new computers, some fancy hardware, and you go and uh, you eventually break it. You spend 100,000 baht and you get the password to my bank account and you steal all my 10,000 baht from my bank account. Is that cipher computationally secure? That would say is computationally secure because the cost for you to break it, 100,000 baht, exceeds the cost of the value of the information, 10,000 baht that you can get from my bank account. So we if we can value information, if we can put a number to uh, the information, what it's worth, then we can talk about whether the cost of breaking it exceeds that value. So we want a cipher such that it's too expensive to break to get the information of value. 
Well, that sounds easy, but it's very hard to put cost to information. All right, the cost of the value of my password for my bank account corresponds to how much money is in my bank account. What's the value of the password to your uh, Gmail account? That's hard to put a number to. What's the value of uh, encrypting some confidential information for a company? Again, hard to put numbers to uh, the value of information. So it's hard to measure that. The other way is that, uh, that the time required to break the cipher exceeds the useful lifetime of the encrypted information. So, say, the encrypted information is, in is the location of where some uh, military attack is going to occur. Okay? So tomorrow, the, some military is going to drop a bomb at some location. The people uh, who are against that military want to find out where the bomb will be dropped so that they uh, can not be there when the bomb is dropped or to move. Okay? It's going to be dropped tomorrow. We need to know the location. So the people who want to find out the location go and find and try and break the cipher of that encrypted information. And it takes them two weeks to break the cipher. Is that a good cipher? I would say that's a good cipher because it takes them two weeks to break it. The information is only valid for one day because they dropped the bomb after one day. So we need to find, we need to break the cipher before one day, otherwise the bomb drops on us. So here is about time. The time required to break the cipher, if we call this cipher computationally secure, must be longer than the useful lifetime of the information. Again, that's hard to measure. You encrypt, uh, you encrypt an email. How long should that email stay encrypted for? Okay, it's hard to put numbers to the time for, for what's the lifetime of particular information? What's the lifetime of an email? What's the lifetime of uh, a file you want to encrypt and protect from someone accessing? But if we can measure those things, we can talk about an algorithm that is computationally secure. But it's hard to measure those things. So it's hard to put a number, this algorithm is more secure than another. Or this algorithm is computationally secure. But we need some way to compare. What else do we miss? I think just one more slide. Right, we covered all that. This one. And we may see it later when we see some attacks on a real cipher. So far, we've said, what does the attacker know? What do we assume? We assume that they know the ciphertext. Somehow, they can intercept and find the ciphertext. That's a given. And we assume that they know the algorithms used. They know the cipher. So if I'm using the Vision Air cipher, and you're trying to attack and find my plain text that I've sent to someone else, you're going to assume that you know that I'm using the Vision Air cipher and that you know the cipher text that I generated. So when attackers are applying cryptanalysis to try and defeat a cipher, we classify the types of attack, attacks in different ways. And this is one classification of, based upon what they know in advance. The normal approach, the normal assumption is called a ciphertext only attack. The attacker only knows the ciphertext and the algorithm. And in fact, we'll go through the other four. In all of these cases, we assume that they know the algorithm and the ciphertext. Algorithm and ciphertext is always known. If the attacker can defeat your cipher using just the encryption algorithm and the ciphertext, then that is the weakest form of a cipher. And we'll compare it with the others in a moment. But in some cases, the attacker may be more successful at defeating the cipher if they know some more information. They don't just know the algorithm and the ciphertext. Maybe they also know some pairs of past plain text ciphertexts that have been generated using the same key. 
This is called a known plaintext attack. An example, and I think we've mentioned it before, but we'll try and write it again. So the challenge here is that uh, A is sending data to B. And some ciphertext was sent. Let's call that ciphertext uh, I. And that ciphertext was obtained by A encrypting some plain text I with some key. I'll just denote K. And that gave us CI. Okay, so what A did was they had some plain text, they encrypted with a key, and they got the ciphertext. They send the ciphertext to B. Now consider the attacker. The malicious user, what do they know? Well, we always assume they know the algorithm. They know E. Similar to the decryption algorithm. The al encryption and decryption algorithms usually go together. So there's one, uh, one name that refers to both, a cipher. And so known to the attacker. And we assume that they know CI. That's the normal information we assume the attacker knows. But in some cases they may know more information. For example, with known plain text, they may know in the past A has sent messages to B and they may know the plain text messages, maybe plain text 1 and the corresponding ciphertext, so a pair. And they may know multiple pairs. The more the better. So, in this case, we assume the malicious user knows the normal information as well as somehow, we don't say how, but somehow they've learned one of the old plain text values, P1, and the corresponding ciphertext, which were obtained using the same key K. Okay, so C1 was obtained by A by encrypting P1 with key K. And somehow the malicious user has learned both of those values. They haven't learned the key. They want to find the key. The key or PI they want to find. But they know some old pairs. So the challenge is to find K or PI. And a known plaintext attack is when the malicious user does know some of the past plaintext ciphertext pairs. The more information the attacker knows, generally the easier it is for them to perform some attack. And so the more pairs known, the easier attacks can be. How do they know that without knowing the key? maybe the message was released through some other means. So maybe plain text P1. Of course, we intercepted C1 yesterday. So today we've intercepted CI as the attacker. Yesterday I intercepted C1 and C2. So I know C1 and C2, but I don't know P1 or P2. How do I learn them? Maybe the information was context or time sensitive. P1 was important yesterday, but today it's been released. So C1 is old and the plain text is old, so maybe there's a way that I can learn the plain text uh, from the past communications. Like that issue, if, if the plain text is exceeded its lifetime, then it may be released. There may be a way for us to find it. So this assumes that the attacker can find past pairs. This is called a known plaintext because we know some plaintext pairs as well. 
There's some variations of that. Known plaintext means that we know about past plaintext and ciphertext pairs. We always know ciphertext because we can intercept. Chosen plaintext is the same except those plaintext messages were chosen by the attacker. So I can't really draw that again. It's the same, but we know some pairs. But P1, I chose that value. That can make it easier for the attacker to try and find weaknesses in the algorithm. That's easy, really, that concept. Maybe the A is some service that encrypts information and sends it to someone. So all I need to do is get A to encrypt a message that I choose. Somehow get A to encrypt P1, although I don't know the key that A used, I can then observe that the ciphertext that A sends to B, C1, so I learn that when A encrypts P1, the value I chose, we get C1. Again, I don't know the key, I want to find that. This is a chosen plain text in that the attacker chooses the values of P and finds the corresponding values of C. Chosen ciphertext is similar, but the attacker gets to choose the ciphertext as well as the corresponding plain text, so the backwards way. Okay. Maybe uh, I choose some ciphertext which I know triggers a weakness in the algorithm. Okay. The algorithm doesn't work on a particular ciphertext, or, or it's weaker for some ciphertext th than others. So what I try and do is get the attacker to, de to decrypt that ciphertext using their secret key, and if I can do that and get that plain text from the decryption, then that can help me in breaking the cipher. So a chosen ciphertext attack is usually even better for the attacker's perspective. Again, they know pairs of plain and ciphertext, but in this case they got to choose the exact ciphertext. Chosen text is a combination of those two. The attacker can choose plain text and find the corresponding ciphertext, and or the attacker can choose ciphertext and find the corresponding plain text. The first point, the more information the attacker knows, generally the easier it is it will be for them to defeat the cipher using cryptanalysis. And even better, if they can control that information that is encrypted. So they can choose the values of plain text because some ciphers may be weaker for particular values. Okay, so they may be strong for most values, but there may be some special case values that those ciphers reveal a weakness. So if we can get the, the users to encrypt or decrypt those values, it can be easier for the attacker. So when people study ciphers and try to compare which one's stronger than the other, they often classify them, is the cipher subject to a chosen text attack? Is it subject to a chosen cipher text attack? And so on. So a cipher that is where a chosen ciphertext attack is possible versus a cipher where a chosen ciphertext attack is not possible, only chosen... Uh, uh, sorry, let's get this correct. A cipher where chosen ciphertext attack is possible versus a cipher where chosen uh, ciphertext only is possible which one's the better cipher? One where it's possible to defeat the cipher only with ciphertext versus it's possible to defeat the cipher if we have chosen ciphertext. We would like a cipher that is not subject to ciphertext only. A cipher that is subject to a ciphertext-only attack is the weakest of them all. Because that's a cipher where the attacker only needs the basic information. So a cipher that is subject to ciphertext-only is the weakest. A cipher that is subject to chosen ciphertext, but not ciphertext-only, would be stronger. That gets confusing. 
even for me. The simplest way to remember, the more information the attacker knows, the easier it is for the attacker. We will see some, some real examples of how people compare ciphers with respect to these known information after we go through some real ciphers, which we will do now. Let's look at the next topic.